Hello there everyone and welcome back to Mortis FM. Today I bring you a different type of video yet again. No, it's not a lightsaber review, but it is a book review. If you've been following us on Instagram, you know that I have teamed up with an awesome group of content creators, High Republic enthusiasts, book enthusiasts in general to cover the High Republic era of Star Wars in chronological order before the Acolytes release in June. We have just wrapped up phase two of the High Republic era, which is essentially like the prequel trilogy. And now we are moving into the original trilogy, which is phase one. And I am lucky enough to start off this phase by kicking it off with this review for Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule. First, I'm just going to give my overall thoughts on the book itself before then diving into spoilers by giving key characters, locations, plot details, etc. So, what did I think of Light of the Jedi? Well, I loved this book. I think that Light of the Jedi is ultimately where if you've not started the High Republic era or know nothing about it, this is where you should start. I was pretty inexperienced when it came to the High Republic era other than some minor stuff from the video games or a couple comic books that I read. This was really my first foray into that era and I gotta say that this is definitely the place to start in my opinion. Charles Soule is an excellent writer, one that I personally click with very well and I think this gives you all of the broad points on getting into this era. It gives you a lot of different characters, a lot of different locations, how the society and, and the Republic works at this time, the villains, a lot of really cool lore implications. And I think if this is something that you wanna get into, start with Light of the Jedi. While it does balance a lot of different characters, as you read, it doesn't feel that jarring. And I think Charles Soule does an amazing job of balancing all these characters and really making you fall in love with them. If you don't know, Light of the Jedi is set about 200 years before the start of The Phantom Menace. And while this is a pretty new, unprecedented era of Star Wars, it still felt very familiar with a lot of cool twists and turns that I wasn't expecting. First of all, it gives you a lot of really cool lore on hyperspace. And while it doesn't necessarily break the rules from what we know, it certainly twists them and gives some new context to it. It also feels very Western inspired. I mean, the Jedi keep their lightsabers in holsters. There's literally a planet that just feels like the Old West, that being Elfrona, and I'll get into that a little bit later. I'm a big fan of Westerns. I'm a big fan of just the frontier in general, and the Outer Rim definitely feels like that. Obviously, the Outer Rim is inhabited, but it still feels lawless, like the Republic isn't fully there. And that's what the Republic is trying to do. It's really trying to incorporate all of these planets and systems into the greater Republic and make it one unified body. So now I'm not going to go full spoilers, but I am going to give some of the elements of the story and key characters before I fully dive into the plot, if that's what you're looking for. The book starts with a major catalyst, and that is the great hyperspace disaster. Essentially, there's a ship that's going out into the Outer Rim. The ship is called the Legacy Run, and it runs into something in one of the hyperspace lanes, which again, if you know how hyperspace works, that doesn't exactly make sense, but trust me, it will make sense later. As it tries to divert, the ship ends up ripping itself apart and gets scattered all throughout the galaxy with these objects flying through hyperspace, or at least coming out of hyperspace at near light speed levels. And so they're crashing into space stations, they're crashing into ships, moons, planets, etc., causing these horrible disasters. And that's really what the Jedi are trying to stop and figure out how it happened in the first place. As the book unfolds, you're basically getting details on how this happened, why this happened, and how the Jedi are going to be able to stop it. You get perspectives from the bad guys, from the good guys, and people somewhere in between. And that's really, really interesting because I think Charles Soule does an amazing job, again, balancing these characters and giving you different insight into all of their minds and their headspaces. So let's introduce some of the characters that are in this book. First and foremost, the Jedi Master Avar Chris. Avar Chris is one of the first Jedi to handle the disaster that's in the Hetzel system in the first act of the book, and then she goes and continues the investigation going throughout. While you don't get a ton of time with her, what you do is really powerful, and I think she's one of the coolest Jedi in this book. She has this really unique ability to be able to link people together through the Force, at least Jedi, to kind of help them aid in battle or in different situations, whatever it may be. And this is a really cool testament of power and strength in the force that Avar has. The next character I want to mention is the Chancellor of the Republic at this time, and that is Chancellor Lena So. I think she's awesome. Again, you don't get a ton of time with her, but what you do is really, really powerful. And I think she is such a force to be reckoned with. She really believes in unifying the Republic, and her motto is, we are all the Republic. 
And I think that's just such a good message. She's really trying to unify all of these systems together. Our next character is Jedi Knight Elzar Man, who is very close friends with Jedi Master Avar Chris. Elzar is an extraordinarily unique Jedi, and personally, he is one of my favorites in this book. The way he views the Force is like an ocean, which I think is super cool, and he's always experimenting to find new heights and new depths with the utilities of the Force. One of the specific plot points is that he is only a Jedi Knight, and the Jedi Council won't make him a master quite yet because the way he uses the Force is so unorthodox, but I think that is a testament to what kind of Jedi he is. I think him and Qui-Gon Jinn would absolutely be best friends. And again, just seeing his perspective and the way he uses the Force is super cool. And anytime you get an Elzar chapter or even brief passage, I was all the way hooked. Another one of my favorites is Jedi Master Loden Greatstorm. Loden is awesome just because I love the way he teaches as a master. He does have an apprentice, Bell Zedifar. I'll get to him in just a second. But again, the way he teaches his apprentice is super cool. I, again, I think it's a little unorthodox, but in kind of a cheeky way. And he has a lot of humor, a lot of heart. And he's also just one of my favorites in this book and a great, great Jedi. So that leads me to Bell Zedifar, who is the Padawan of Loden Greatstorm. Bell is yet again another lovable character, and I love seeing his trials as a Padawan as they're on this adventure on Alfrona, and just seeing him learn under Loden Greatstorm is something that was just such a treat. Every time him and Loden were interacting, I just couldn't help but smile. I think they're such a great master Padawan duo, and Bell is just, he's just a gem. Now let's move on to our bad guys. And this is one of my new favorite villains in Star Wars. That is the Eye of the Nihil, Martian Row, or Markian Row. There's a little bit of debate on how that's pronounced, but I choose to say Martian Row. I don't want to give a ton of details on the Nihil just quite yet if you're still trying to dip your toe in, but I will say the Nihil blew me away. I was not expecting to enjoy their internal structure as much as I would. Originally, I just kind of thought they were bandits, pirates, marauders, and yes, they are that, but there's a little bit of a twist to them. There's a hierarchy, there's a structure to their organization, and there's a lot of backstabbing and twists and turns, and Martian is just a very big part of that that I, I really, really enjoy. I think he is an awesome villain. He reminds me of a little bit of like Heath Ledger's Joker in a way with his planning, but he's not like psychotic and, and you know, like a clown. He's very tactical and thoughtful, and he's always kind of planning his next movie, even when you're not really sure what's happening. Um, so again, if you haven't read the book, look forward to those Marchie and Rose chapters. They're very, very good. Lastly are the three Tempest Runners of the Nihil. That is Pan Itis, Lorna D, and Kasav. These are our three kind of bandit warlords within the Nihil, and you get a little bit of all of them, but I think their dynamic with Marchie and Ro is extremely interesting, and again, just gives two more lore with the, the Nihil structure and operation, and I can't wait to get more of that, but you get plenty of that in this book, and to be honest, I wasn't expecting to enjoy those chapters as much as I did, but when it did get to them, they were always extremely interesting, in no small part to Marchian, but also the Tempest Runners themselves. Now, I have to give credence to my favorite character in this book, and while I would not consider him a key player, he has a key place in my heart, and that is the Blade of Bardada, Porter Engel. Porter Engel is kind of like this Santa Claus type character, at least when you first meet him. He is the cook for a Jedi outpost on this planet of Elfrona, but you'll quickly realize that he has a lot more history to him than you may realize. Porter Engel is a legendary Jedi master and that is very renowned with his lightsaber. And what you do get in this book with him getting to use it is extremely interesting. And I think his connection to the light side is just awesome. And I cannot wait to go back and read his backstory in phase two from the blade, which we already have a review out. So go check that out. Some of the key locations are Elfrona, which I mentioned is kind of like this, this mining Old West style planet, which a really interesting plot happens there. Then you've got the Starlight Beacon, which is essentially a space station out in the Outer Rim that's going to really help outreach to all of these different planets and systems and create this just unifying force. It's going to help uh, with communications back to the core. It's going to be an exhibit for all of these different planets that will rotate. And of course, Jedi are going to have their own outpost on this station. I already mentioned this system earlier, but the Hetzel system is kind of the main 
place where the great hyperspace disaster opens in the beginning of the book, and that is a pretty important location as well. And lastly is the Nihil base of operations. It's not exactly one place. They they hole up in this place called No Space, which is tied to their weird origins with hyperspace and how they use it in this extremely unconventional way, which you get more as you read the book. But No Space is essentially this this kind of like floating platform out in space with like this this invisible dome around it. No Space is where the Tempest Runners all meet and rally along with Marshy and Roe and their subservience. And I think just the scene that you get here with the Great Hall of the Nihil and No Space is incredibly interesting and one of the main locations of this book. So now let me break down the plot of this book. If you don't have any interest in reading it, I'm going to try to recap it for you as best as possible. The first act of this book is the Jedi and the Republic handling this disaster as these pieces of debris from the Legacy Run are coming to impact Hetzal. And eventually they do. They do succeed with uh, with pretty minimal losses. However, these pieces aren't just impacting the Hetzel system. They're impacting other systems across the Outer Rim. So the Chancellor assigns the Jedi to make sure this is stopped and that this does not happen again before the opening of Starlight Beacon. Then we move into Act 2, where a lot of our plots are kind of split up. Marshy and Roe, they're trying to plan out some of their operations. And then we get Avar Chris and Elzar Man, along with a few other Republic people, trying to figure out how they can predict the trajectory of the debris from the Legacy Run and make sure it doesn't happen again. Avar Chris and Elzar Man end up meeting with the Santecas, who are hyperspace prospectors, and if you know the sequels, you know Lore Santeca is a descendant of that bloodline, but essentially they know how hyperspace works, and so they're trying to figure out how a piece or a ship or whatever it may be showed up in a hyperspace lane, and they reveal that's impossible, but it's clear that they're hiding a little bit of something. From Marchian's Rose perspective, we end up finding out that he's actually using one of the ascendants of the Santecas, and that is Mari Santeca. And she's able to calculate these weird paths through hyperspace, the way the Nihil use hyperspace using these things called path engines, and help the Nihil essentially just appear and disappear at will. We don't get a full explanation quite yet as to why Mari Santeca is able to do these crazy abilities, make these crazy calculations through hyperspace where the Nihil can essentially just come and go as they please, but we do get a little bit of teases and we know that Martian Rose's family essentially stole her from the Santecas when she was very, very little, when she was like six years old, and now she's nearly a hundred years old, or maybe even older. The Nihil using Mari Santeca are actually allowed to figure out where the trajectories of the pieces of the Legacy Run are going to pop up, and so they use that to their advantage. However, one of the Tempest Runners ends up failing miserably as he uses one of these trajectories to hold Iriadu hostage and essentially is like, hey, if you don't give me money, I'm not going to stop these popping up and destroying your planet because at the time, the Republic don't know how to do this. Well, they end up missing the last one and it causes this huge destruction, but the governor of Iriadu had already transferred the money, so she vows to seek revenge on this Tempest Runner. The Republic, with the help of Kevin Tarr of the Hetzel system, end up discovering the trajectories of all of the different pieces, and so they track down the flight recorder. However, my favorite plot throughout the book is with Bell and with Loden. They're on Elfrona and they get a call that essentially the Nihil are kidnapping this one family to take them for ransom. And so we get this really awesome sequence of events with them two, as well as two other Jedi, including my guy, Porter Engel, as they're trying to stop the Nihil from kidnapping this family. It ends up being revealed that Martian Road didn't actually care about holding this family hostage at all. He actually knew that there was a Jedi outpost on Elfrona and he was just hoping that the Nihil would end up capturing one of them. And that's what happens. Lone Great Storm ends up getting captured along with one of the other hostages. And the Jedi don't really know what happened to him. They think that they've killed him. Kasav is set up by Martian. And there's this really, really cool battle between the Republic Defense Coalition and the Nihil. And they're entirely wiped out. At least his Tempest is. They think that the Nihil have been destroyed to kind of get them off of the greater organization's tail. And the Jedi, they do end up launching Starlight Beacon. Elzar Man ends up having a vision at the end of the book that makes him realize not everything is all rainbows and sunshine, that there is a darkness coming, that this is not over yet, and there is a lot more bloodshed, violence, and fear to come. I know that's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of characters. I hope I did a good job of explaining myself and trying to help them connected. I will say it is probably to your advantage to read this book yourself, but The High Republic has a lot of moving pieces, and so I think it's just really rewarding to be able to read it yourself. But again, hopefully I did a good job of explaining it. 
I think the characters in this book are amazing. I think Charles Soule did an amazing job writing it. And I, for one, cannot wait to get into the next piece of High Republic content in the timeline. Be sure to go to Instagram and follow all of the creators that are part of our High Republic recap to see what the next review is. Thank you all for watching. And as always, may the force be with you. We are all the Republic.